and welcome to McGuire Woods Edible Bites, where we bring you bite-sized updates on all things happening in the life sciences space, including cannabis, hemp, CBD, and other emerging markets. Our updates are quick and packed with key industry developments that you can watch during your morning coffee, while having lunch, or on a brain break. We're excited to discuss today's food for thought. Let's get noodling. I'm Kate Hardy, and I'm a partner in the Charlotte office at McGuire Woods, and I'm here today with my colleague, Royce Juvenet, who is in our Chicago office, where it's always chilly and cold. Hey, Royce, how you doing? <laughs> I'm freezing. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> 26 degrees outside today in Chicago. Yeah, well, it's cold here in Charlotte, too, but not as cold as it is there. All right, well, for today's episode, we are going to touch on the recently dropped final FDA compounding pharmacy memorandum of understanding. And this is something that the FDA published that it expects states to sign essentially to monitor what's happening with compounding pharmacies in the state. And in particular, and we'll talk about, um, the MOU sets forth how the state is supposed to monitor these pharmacies and collect data and monitor adverse events, but it also really has some big restrictions on how compounding pharmacies can ship product across the United States, depending on whether the state signs the MOU or doesn't sign the MOU. And that's gonna mean big changes for a lot of compounding pharmacies, and those changes are going to be coming in about a year. The FDA basically gave the states um, about a year to decide whether or not they're going to sign it. So with that, let's get started and dive right in. All right, Royce, this is our first slide, but before we sort of get into the nitty gritty with the MOU and what it says and what has to happen, Let's, let's just talk about um, compounding pharmacies. Like, what are they? What do they do? Sort of what's the history? How, how did we get here? Yeah, yeah. So compounding pharmacies occupy a really neat intersection between, you know, state law as it governs, you know, the practice of medicine and pharmacy and um, health using the state's police powers versus kind of the federal regulation that was given to FDA under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act to regulate drugs, foods, cosmetics, um, biologics. And where we see is, a, is an intersection of state and federal law where compounding pharmacies exist to take existing medications that might be out there or um, other bulk drugs and allow a physician to tailor the medication to an individual patient. And um, as part of that physician's medical belief or justification for why the patient, you know, for a particular treatment strategy, a you know, great example is, you know, a uh, patient has trouble swallowing pills. Uh, the pills might need to be combined with another medication, but the patient can only do it through a liquid. You'd go to a compounding pharmacy to take two capsule type medications, mm -hmm. blend them together in a liquid part of that physician's treatment plan for the patient. That, um, there is a place under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act for compounding pharmacies. The act, you know, under the amendments, breaks them up into what we call 503A and 503B facilities. Yeah. 503Bs are sometimes also called outsourcing facilities. And under the act, a 503A facility is, you know, kind of think about it as, you know, I won't even call it a facility. A 503A compounding pharmacy it's, you know, your, your local compounder. Um, it, it's a pharmacist or a group of pharmacists that have a, a pharmacy that's specifically designed to compound medications for um, as contemplated a community or within a state. And those medications have to be on a per, and this is the really important part, for 503A has to be for an identifiable patient per drug per script. So you can't um, necessarily make, you know, 50 different kinds of compounded, uh, you know, 
uh, statins in a, a bubblegum flavor liquid form unless you have identifiable patients. And that's the limitation of the 503A is that you can't do bulk drug manufacturing. There's a reason for that because the 503A does not have to follow the strict requirements. It's what we call pharmaceutical current good manufacturing practices or CGMPs. Previously, they're known as GMPs. And 503Bs, though, are different. Outsourcing facilities can make a, a bulk amount of drug, doesn't necessarily need to have a identifiable patient, but because of that, because of that exception to the 503Bs, um, that they get a little bit more leeway, they have to follow much more strict quality requirements. And those really come as a result of the, the, the meningitis outbreak in New England, which I think killed around 70 patients. And that was kind of a wake up call for FDA to enforce in this space. Um, and, you know, if you're a, a compounding pharmacy, you have to pay really close attention to whether or not you're acting as a 503A, or you may inadvertently be acting as an outsourcing facility because if you are, that would uh, invite enforcement from FDA or the state board. Yeah, and so the, the 503Bs, uh, they're more sort of akin to like a big drug manufacturer. They are regularly inspected by the FDA, very high standards expensive. And then the 503A, to me, I kind of think of them sometimes like more your just your local pharmacy, you know, small type stuff, like you said, individual patient prescription. Um, where we see a lot of um, compounding go on is in the eye space. Um, just to kind of give an example as well, um, since we're going to talk about shipping and everything, um, a, a lot of... Um, a lot of vision practices compound a drug product, um, which is, and Bryce, you can talk about this a little bit more. It's, it's administered differently for patients and it's gotta be broken down. Um, I don't wanna, it's the drug is ILEA. Um, I don't wanna get too much into the, the drug, but that's an area where we see a lot of compounding. And I know we're aware of um, quite a few large vision practices where they've got offices maybe in several different states and um, they are compounding this product for their patients and also shipping it, you know, to the different states where they have their offices. Yeah. Uh, areas like ophthalmology invite or allow for really unique opportunity in compounding because of the amount of drugs that, you know, the ophthalmologist might give post cataract surgery or post, you know, any other procedure where, Ophthalmology doesn't really have, you know, it, it's not an area where you see massive amounts of, you know, drug development in combinations because of the amount of effort that it takes to get an eye drug on the market. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of physicians may say, well, medication compliance is a huge issue after any procedure. I'm going to work with a compounding pharmacy to blend, you know, a prednisone with an antibiotic with something else so yeah. that my patient can can have a once, you know, a one-stop shop for compliance when it comes to um, you know, post surgery. And you know, that's that's kind of a, you know, it's of course a judgment call on the physician and working with the pharmacy. What FDA doesn't want to see, though, is, you know, there are combination ophthalmology drugs on the, uh, you know, out there that have gone through the drug approval process, and FDA doesn't really want to see that uh, drug approval process that is out there for pharma uh, having a kind of like a, a backdoor to get a new drug on the market that is a combination product, because combination products have to go through very strict, you know, although a bridge sometimes efficacy and safety trials with FDA in order to launch the drug. Yep. Thank you. And that I think that's kind of a good background and just uh, description of compounding um, for folks that maybe are a little bit less familiar with what it is. And so now let's talk a little bit about the actual MOU, which was um, published at the end of October. 
Um, this is according to FDA, the, the final version of the MOU. For those people who have been tracking it, um, there's been a couple of different versions that FDA has published over the last couple of years. Um, a lot of people have made comments on it, but FDA said, okay, you know, this is it. We're going with this one. This is final. Um, and like we said, FDA, when it published this, gave states basically a year um, to decide whether or not they were going to sign. And then once that happens, um, they're going to be looking for enforcement uh, of the requirements, both from the state perspective and from the compounding pharmacy perspective. So a couple of key things like we talked about um, to really just be thinking about with this MOU is how it's going to limit a compounding pharmacy's ability to ship product out of the state. So there's two buckets of dates that are going to happen once um, the next year goes by. You're either going to be in a state that has signed the MOU, and we'll talk about that, or you're going to be in a state that's elected, at least for the time being, not to sign the MOU. Um, so let's let's talk about um, the key provisions for states that are going to sign the MOU. And this is where you get into, as I put on the slide, um, some, some math. Um, if you are a compounding pharmacy in a state that has signed an MOU, you cannot ship what's called inordinate amounts of compounded drug out of the state. And the way you figure out if you are going to meet those requirements is like I said, you have to do a math problem where basically you look at the number of prescriptions, the compounded prescriptions you have, and then you're also going to take into consideration the number of prescriptions you have dispensed, meaning patients have come and picked those up, and the number of prescriptions you have distributed, meaning the number of prescriptions you have sent out. And when you do that division problem, you cannot be greater than 50% of the total prescription. So that's a lot of work um, for a pharmacy to have to keep up with. I mean, to have to count the number of prescriptions and be track, and this is on an annual basis. Um, so to be tracking all of this information and making sure you're staying within that number um, is gonna be hard. And then the, the MOU also asks the state uh, to be collecting that information as well, to be, to be tracking it. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you're a compounding pharmacy right now, you're, you're really going to be asking yourself the question of, you know, where does my state stand? What's going on? Where am I at with my business in terms of our shipment and our volume? And, you know, what are the enhanced requirements that I'm going to have to meet? And it, it may be an opportunity for, you know, as a compounding pharmacy to say, you know, we're really just doing our thing here. But, you know, should we start having conversations with our state board of pharmacy about this as constituents, as people that make up, you know, the, pharma the compounding pharmacy community within a state? Is my state going to sign this MOU with FDA if my state doesn't want to or has declared? And we haven't seen, um, we've only seen a couple instances of states coming out with it, which we'll get to on, you know, where they stand on this. But, you know, if my state is very steadfast and not, you know, agreeing to go along with FDA or there's federalism issues that the state believes exist here, then I'm going to have to think about a year from now, what does that look like for my business if, if, you know, FDA really is going to enforce, you know, is, you know, is the current lawsuit, which we'll talk about going to, you know, go all the way? Do I think that there's validity to it? You're really thinking hard about as your business as a compounding pharmacy about, you know, is, is this the most hospitable environment for my, my pharmacy two years from now? Right, exactly. And and one thing um, we also, uh, well, two things, the, the state boards of pharmacy that are thinking about whether or not they want to sign this, I mean, there's definitely administrative requirements on them. There's data collecting requirements. You know, some states may or may not have the bandwidth really be doing that. Mm -hmm. That might be a factor yeah. as to whether or not they sign it. And then one other thing to be thinking about is, um, 
this whole inordinate amount of compounding related to shipping compounded product out of state, that is completely different from another inordinate amount that comes up in the compounding space. And that is compounding inordinate, inordinate amounts of a copy of a drug product, um, which basically is copying a drug product that's already on the market. And FDA was very clear that, you know, we now have inordinate amount, both from a shipping perspective and from compounding um, copies of essential drugs. So that's just a little nuance um, that's also important to, to appreciate. Absolutely. And, you know, that, that distinction is really important because, you know, oftentimes as a compounding pharmacy, you may have a, a physician uh, or physician's practice come to you and say, you know, we really want, you know, we think there's another way to make, you know, this product using bulk drug substance. And as a compounding pharmacy, you're going to have to first pay attention to whether or not you're making essential copies, which is the subject of a whole other guidance. But then you're also going to have to think about, like, am I going to also be making, you know, inordinate amounts of, you know, a drug product that might be going interstate and you know, another point is boards of pharmacy are very small in some states, yeah. and some are more communicative than others. And it it may be, you know, if you're a small compounding pharmacy or a, a regular, you know, a larger compounding pharmacy in the state, the state board of pharmacy, in our experience, that there is accessibility there, and they're willing to listen and have conversations with the pharmacists in their state about what looks good. And it, it's an opportunity to, you know, I think educate or even tell the state board of pharmacy where you, as the pharmacist, stand, or also, you know, educate uh, interest, you know, stakeholders in in legislature, other parts of the government in the state on, you know, what is compounding? What is my business like? What am I doing here? Because it's just something that a, a lot of lawmakers just don't think about a lot. Yeah, and I think definitely in the compounding space, there are very strong views um, on one yeah. side or the other. I mean, it's definitely um, a hot topic that's been debated quite a bit. I and mean, people have their views on safety and then people have their views on, of course, access to medicine. So there's good points on either side. So let's just move on um, and talk about what happens if your state um, doesn't sign the MOU. And what that means is if you are a compounding pharmacy, you can ship even less compounded product out of the state. Um, that number goes all the way down to 5%. I mean, it's a very, very small number um, that can be shipped out, which could potentially be a, a huge business hit um, for a lot of folks if they're in a state um, that may not sign it. Uh, so to your point, really good idea to try to maybe see if you can get a feel, um, you know, so you can be planning ahead if you're gonna have to shift um, maybe some of your business folks. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really, you know, it, if you're thinking about that 5% and you're thinking about where my business is and the fact that I do rely a lot on interstate shipment, you know, you're going to, and, you know, we're now a year from now and the state has decided that they're not going to sign the MOU, you know, that's going to be a tough business decision about whether or not your pharmacy and your pharmacy operation and everything that you've got you know, either needs to be focused more locally on that state or you need to choose a different jurisdiction to operate out of. And, you know, there's there's ways of doing all of that. There are multi-state um, operators or pharmacists who work together that may have a pharmacy, you know, in Georgia and one in South Carolina. And that that is certainly an option to consider, you know, where do I want to, you know, have the bulk of, my, bulk of my operation to be. But uh, again, a lot of compounding pharmacies are not like that and are not situated right across from the state line from one another. Right. No, that's a great point. And the, that 5% calculation is essentially the same thing. It takes into account both prescriptions that are picked up, um, dispensed, and prescriptions that are distributed. So same, same kind of math going on there. And the other point I'll just make here real quick is 
Um, you know, a lot of this, according to FDA, is going to try to inform their enforcement priorities. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think the whole overarching point, whatever side you fall on on this is, you know, they're, they're trying to focus on patient safety and, you know, make sure particularly with sterile products that there's no contamination issues. And if you do get a compounded product, you, you have some good assurances of, of the quality and the sterility if it's a sterile product. All right, so let's talk real quick. Um, we've talked while we're going through this a lot about the different state boards. Um, this is gonna be another interesting thing that develops over the next year. You know, some boards have already, like we have um, Massachusetts have, you know, some time ago put out some very specific limitations and requirements about compounding. Royce, you and I talked, I mean, we're still sort of seeing the state. It's only been a couple months with and had COVID and a lot of other things going on, sort of seeing what the states are going to do about signing this MOU. We have an um, example here, the North Carolina Board of Pharmacy, interestingly, is soliciting comments on what it should do. So, you know, you're definitely going to want to pay attention to what's on the Board of Pharmacy website, but also, you know, like we also discussed, be proactive and um, really be thinking a lot about this because it's not going to be something you want to get caught, you know, towards the end of next year and not have a good idea about what's going on. Um, one yeah. other point. Oh, one other point that I oh. um, <laughs> I want to make about the MOU with respect to business considerations is the MOU can be terminated with 60 days notice. So if you're in a state that has decided, okay, yes, we're gonna sign this MOU, go forward to the point we discussed earlier, if there's resource issues or the state says, you know what, this is just costing us too much money, we're just not gonna do this anymore. The state can give 60 days notice and say, guess what, we're done, we're not doing this anymore. And for compounding pharmacies in that state, you basically are gonna get 60 days notice that a lot of your business could potentially change significantly. And it works the other way as well. If FDA is not happy, they can also provide notice to the state. So it, it's hard to, I think, be able to plan your business when really you've got sort of a two month window where things could potentially change a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also on the government, a fair side of things. Think of it more as an opportunity to educate stakeholders. There, you know, state legislatures may not be thinking about this question very often. State boards of pharmacy may have a lot of internal questions about how best can we comply with this. And you know, if you're of the opinion that the MOU makes sense and is something that might be good for business in your state, given where FDA is. It, it might be more of a conversation about reassuring the state board or figuring out how you as the, the local compounding pharmacy community can work with the state board. If your opinion is on the other side that, you know, this MOU just doesn't make sense or, you know, we really don't like, or we want to find a different way that the state can work with FDA on carrying out the, the priorities of the MOU, that could be a conversation as well. I'm, I'm figuring out just how does the state plan to enforce, what does that mean in terms of my inspection, inspection rigor that I'm going to encounter every year, my licensure, and, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of work for both the states and FDA. It's a very comprehensive regulatory regime that's being put in place with the MOU, and it's going to be requiring a lot more effort on the state boards and FDA to, to really stay active in this space. Yeah, and I think either way, you know, I don't see the guillotine just coming down on day 365 and then, you know, the world is completely different. I mean, there's obviously going to be some ramp up time, some transition time and things won't work. But to be prepared and be thinking about how it might impact your business is going to be really important um, during this next year. Yeah, absolutely, Kate. I mean, overall, FDA is not in the business of, you know, cutting off access to medications or, you know, impacting 
decisions and if there is a trend or if there is, you know, any sort of thought that maybe the MOU as written is not providing patient access to care, um, you know, the MOU can can be revisited by FDA and the states. It's a memorandum of understanding. It's not necessarily hardcore statutory law. And I think that over the next couple of years, the MOU might change and might evolve as the states and FDA figure it out. Yes, well, and actually, of course, as we expected, um, as soon as, well, not pretty much right after the FDA published the MOU, there was a lawsuit filed. There's several different pharmacies involved in the lawsuit across a lot of different states. Um, trying to enjoin FDA from even being able to implement this with the states. Um, a lot of the arguments in here are just your typical administrative law arguments that FDA has exceeded its authority. We should have had notice and comment rulemaking, um, stuff like that. But then the complaint also gets into, you know, some of the business things that we talked about and, um, again, being on notice in 60 days if, if you might have to completely change your practice and what is that gonna do to, um, to patients um, and patient care? So we'll have to see how the lawsuit plays out. I mean, it is possible that the court will say, everybody go back to the drawing board, this isn't gonna work. You've gotta go through the notice and comment rulemaking and all of this might not be something we have to worry about, but. Uh, at least people can hopefully start being prepared because, you know, who knows, we might go through notice and comment rulemaking, have this exact same MOU, and then, you know, two years from now, we're mostly in the same place. So we'll, we'll see what yeah. happens. We'll be monitoring it, and it'll be interesting. And as always, if, you know, if you have questions for Kate and I, just reach out. We work a lot in this space. We help a lot of clients with compounding pharmacy issues. And, uh, you know, we believe that, you know, there is a place for compounding pharmacy. There is a place for, you know, a safe and effective compounding operation. And we're also more than happy to walk through what does it mean to be a 5 3 a versus a 5 3 b Yeah. Well, I mean, and all this is just an interesting dynamic for um, investors in the space right now because there's, you know, you base your investment on existing practices. And if you don't know what a state's going to do... Um, you know, your investment thesis could change significantly um, yeah. very quickly. So let's just move on um, and wrap up and do our food for thought. But before we get to that, a uh, normal disclaimer that we give during our video cast, and uh, that is that nothing you hear on the Edible Bites podcast should be considered legal advice in any way, shape, form, or fashion. We are not forming an attorney-client relationship and all of the other disclaimers um, that we are making. This is all informational and food for thought. So let's wrap up. Um, you know, we've talked about this, but things to be thinking about. What are your current practices? What are the products you have? Where are you shipping those products? Um, there is obviously a patchwork of 50 state boards of pharmacy that have a lot of work to do. Um, and you could be looking at very different rules, but as a compounding pharmacy, you need to focus on where's your home state because where you are licensed in your home state is gonna dictate your shipping rules. Um, you can't pick and choose if you are registered as a foreign pharmacy in a state that signs the MOU and say, well, we're just gonna go with those laws. So, um, you know, it's mm -hmm. important to follow up with what your what your state boards are doing, be proactive in lobbying if, if that's something you're interested in. And we'll have to track this lawsuit and see what happens. Um, you know, maybe everybody will get a pause on this and we'll be revisiting it later. And and any other any other concluding thoughts from you, Royce? Yeah, absolutely. I'd I'd say, you know, uh, as in, you know, first compounding pharmacies need to grow, need to expand, and, and definitely are looking for partners to invest with them. And, you know, if, if you're an investor, you're someone that's thinking of getting into the space, you know, it, it may be worth, you know, some time to really look into, you know, what jurisdiction do I think is leaning more towards signing the MOU or not signing the MOU? 
And then, you know, what are the, the pharmacies that are looking for a partnership opportunity with my group in the pharmacy working together to help grow this space? And I, I think that that's going to be another part of the diligence process when we look at these it is really considering, you know, where do we stand right now on the MOU? And, you know, will our partner pharmacy, what will that look like for their business? Yep. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, yeah. Hope this has been helpful information and until next time, you all can noodle on that. Thanks very much.